Good evening and a warm welcome to the news live on Channel I. I'm Sharon Maskrinas. Very good evening, I'm Lakshita Singha. We start off by taking a look at the headlines for tonight. The presidential election is on the 16th of November. Nominations are being accepted from the 7th of October. The president says the present day teacher should be of great personality and a creative person. A letter of demand sent to Kalum Palita for making defamatory and false statements on the national television. Permanent appointments to state employees who were engaged in service for more than 180 days. Trainee official appointments for 4,200 external graduates. An uncertain verdict in the Israel general election. On to the stories in detail now, starting off with local news. The Election Commission has decided to conduct the presidential election on the 16th of November. Accordingly, the nominations are scheduled to be called from the 7th of October. The Election Commission says that the statement made under the second clause in the Act to elect a president or the GASA notification relating to calling of nominations of the presidential election has been sent to the government printer for publication. The candidates are able to place deposits from tomorrow till the 6th of October. The Cabinet of Ministers has approved to provide permanent appointments to employees who were engaged in employment for more than 180 days upon recruitment to the primary grades of state institutions on temporary, casual, substitute, contract or relief basis. Accordingly, permanent appointments with pensions will be provided for the recruits who fulfilled the required qualifications before the 1st of September. The proposal has been presented by the Prime Minister, the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Public Administration, Disaster Management and Livestock Development. Under this program, permanent appointments are being granted to the workers who are unable to gain permanency in their positions due to not being able to fulfill the requirements of Circulars of Public Administration 25 of 2014 and 25 of 2014 Article 1. The program also facilitates employees in primary grade of state institutions who have been recruited based on service needs following the issuance of the circulars. The Cabinet of Ministers has also granted to declare the period from September 15th to October 15th as the Information Month in parallel to the International Day to Right of Information on the 28th of September. Under the program, it has also been proposed to issue a circular to all state institutions in order to be engaged in activities pertaining to the Act during the period and also to organize programs to enlighten civilians covering all divisional secretariat divisions. Approval has also been granted to implement RIT mobile service in five elected districts under the title Right of Information to the Village. This was a proposal presented by the President on the request of non-Cabinet Minister of Media. Former Deputy Speaker of the British Parliament, Lord Naseby, says that Sri Lanka is able to take leadership in global centre stage. He made these remarks participating in a special ceremony of the Organisation of Professional Association of Sri Lanka in Colombo yesterday. The President, Maitri Palasirisena, presided over the ceremony. The special ceremony was connected with the 32nd Annual Conference of the Organisation of Professional Association of Sri Lanka. The theme of the event was the role of professionals in sustainable development. The keynote address was delivered by Deshamanya Professor Mohan Munasingha. Former Deputy Speaker of the British Parliament, Lord Naseby, was the chief guest on this occasion. I'm willing to take a bet many in this room have never been to. I went to every single market I could find to see the traders. And what a joy it was to go around there. What a joy it is in recent years to have revisited these parts. Well preserved world heritage sites you have. I talk in the UK about uh, Polonarua, Sikoria, Anuradhapura, all of them. All of them beautifully kept and restored from earlier generation. And, okay, we had a slight hiccup at Easter. We, Sri Lankan, are one of the fastest growing tourist destinations in the world. So I think to myself, why not be the hub focused for sustainable development in South Asia? Or who knows, you could be the leader for the world hub. But certainly for South Asia, next door, you've got India and Pakistan take on that challenge. It's there. That's leadership. I've actually written a book on my life in Sri Lanka. It will be published in February. 
next year. The title is Sri Lanka, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, Reflections from 50 Years of a, new, a Unique Friendship Between a British Politician and the People of Sri Lanka. I'm also hopeful of having it jointly published with a local company here in Sri Lanka. And I finish with a quote. These are the final words in my book, and they're part of a poem written by Milton, a parliamentarian who wrote during our civil war these words, and they seem particularly apt to Sri Lanka today. Methinks I see in my mind a noble and puissant nation, arousing herself like a strong man after sleep, shaking her invincible locks. Methinks I see her as an eagle mewing her mighty youth and kindling her undazzled eyes at the full midday sun. In other words, the opportunity is there. All that's required is the leadership to make it happen. Let me talk very briefly about what are the problems of sustainability. We have resource shortages, food, energy, and water. We have poverty and inequality, which has been around for a long time. We have problems in the financial sector, shocks and disasters, conflicts, and so on. Climate change is, of course, the ultimate threat multiplier because it makes all the other problems worse. These problems interact in a bad way. But we, the stakeholders, 7 0.5 billion people on this planet are very uncoordinated in the way we respond. I'm sorry to say that at the very top level, there is very weak leadership. But there is much more action from mid-level le leaders like city mayors, CEOs of companies, and professionals like you. In 1992, at the Rio Earth Summit more than 25 years ago, I presented a framework called Sustainomic and this balanced inclusive green growth path. Our own Sri Lanka 2030 vision report is based on these core concepts. As a Singaporean and a real estate professional, I can appreciate the value of property development and the social economic impact it brings to the country and its people. As you know, Singapore is a tiny island with 5.6 million people sharing 724 square kilometres of land, and about 25% of each of this precious land mass is from reclamation. So sustainable national development has always been a priority for Singapore and I'm sure with Sri Lanka as well. Port City has added 269 hectares of reclaimed land to Colombo and is now declared as an urban development area under UDA. However, that is only the fiscal aspect. We are working with the government of Sri Lanka to build a world-class city for South Asia and to achieve that vision, we plan to break ground and develop the International Financial Centre next year. In order for this to happen, we will need the land titles, government policies and incentives to attract both local and foreign investments. President Sirisena has presented a memento to Lord Nesby in appreciation of his support towards Sri Lanka's various international platforms. A special souvenir was also presented to the President. President of the OPA and Engineer Nisanka Pereira was among the large gathering on this occasion. Now, meanwhile, letters of appointment on training officers have been presented to 4,200 external graduates today. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has presided over the event at the Temple Trees. The ceremony in this connection was organized by the Ministry of National Policy, Economic Affairs, Resettlement and Rehabilitation, Northern Province Development and Youth Affairs. The appointment letters have been presented to external graduates representing every district in the island. The appointments have been made under three stages on the concept of recruitment of graduates to the state service. The first stage of the program was carried out last year through recruitment of 3,200 graduates to the state service. Under the second stage, 16,800 recruitments to the state service were carried out in August of this year. 4,200 recruitments have taken place today under the third stage of the program. The trainees are scheduled to undergo a training period of one year. The Prime Minister said on this occasion that his objective is to provide employment to every unemployed person in the next five years. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe said that economic stability has now been restored. He added that in the next five years, attention will be focused on investments and generation of employment opportunities. He also said that they have already run the first round. They are running the second round to create jobs. It took some time to come to the present status. The Premier said that, however, this journey could not be shortened. 
If the process was briefed, a situation may arise of not being able to pay the salaries. He also said that they are now coming to the stage of creating sources of revenue for all in the next five years. Those who fulfill university or technical college education or education in a central college will be given employment. Mahasangha MPs and ministers and state officials graced the occasion. Minister Sajid Premadasa says that an era of the common man will be created by overcoming all challenges through the strength given by the masses. The minister was participating in the Samata 7, a mobile service program in Tangol today. The program was conducted at the premises of the Tangol bus stand. Relief valued at 30.89 million rupees was or has been presented to more than 2,750 families in the Tangol Divisional Secretariat Division. In parallel to this event, Visiri housing loans amounting to 25.74 million rupees were distributed among 1,287 families. In addition, several more programs have been conducted in connection with the handing over of relief valued at more than 60 million rupees. State Minister Dilip Vedarachi also participated at the ceremony. Now, meanwhile, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe says that the close relationship between the Chinese Communist Party and the United National Party has enabled to strengthen friendship between the two countries. He made these remarks at a meeting with the Politburo member of the Chinese Communist Party and Communist Party Secretary of the Chongqing Municipality, Chen Mina, today. A delegation of the Chinese Communist Party and the Communist Party International Department met the Prime Minister at the Temple Trees today. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has pointed out on this occasion that the global economic power is centering in Asia. He has reiterated that the time has come to remain vigilant on the future Asian challenges. He added that countries near the Indian Ocean have shown more population and economic growth. He also said that more attention should also be focused on marketing needs of the regional countries. Opinions have also been exchanged on several other issues, including stabilization of sustainable peace in the Indian Ocean. The Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2019 concluded in Colombo today. The two-day event was themed around recalibrating Sri Lanka's economic trajectory towards 2025 to guide Sri Lanka's journey towards development and prosperity. The panel discussion of the final session of the summit was on the theme State-Owned Enterprises Recipe for Reform. State Minister of Finance, Eran Vikram Ratna, Parliamentarian Dr. Sarat Tamnugama and other professionals were present at the session as the panelists. They shared remarks on the proposed reforms to introduce to the development of the state-owned enterprises in the country. When I talk about our party's policy, you will see that there's a gap between our party's policy and actually the government. The policy is that if you have to provide that subsidy, don't compromise the institution. Let the institution run efficiently, provide the subsidy through the national budget. The reason I put it like that is because it's very difficult sometimes to communicate. It's not really you're selling a national asset. It's actually financial terms is a national liability but in economic terms it's seen as a national asset so the bottom line is that we do not necessarily have to own most of it but if we decide to own something for a strategic reason which can be debated among various people then that involves a political price and if there is a political price to the service that's being provided then that should be compensated through the national budget everything else that you have there needs to be probably commonly held that is why i strongly believe that state-owned enterprises unless it is just strategic or is meeting a market failure or a development objective if that's defined take that out identify it keep it out everything else must go under a structure which is depoliticized and is accountable and one day it may not even be a state-owned enterprise it might be given completely to the private sector i must admit 
that uh, sometimes the political will lax, and particularly, I don't blame only the politician for that, because it's a reflection of the mandate itself. And if the mandate is decisive, I think it makes it much more easier. And if the mandate is mixed, then definitely it makes it much more difficult. You have to build a national consensus and get away from this party-oriented thing if you really want to take this country forward. Current losses, apart from all the other things, was having a direct impact on our fiscal stability. It was limiting the discretionary powers of the government and the Minister of Finance to really even prepare this budget. Because when we begin thinking of preparing the budget, we have to, apart from our recurrent costs and so on, the normal classification, we have to set apart a large amount of our prospective income to offset the losses from the SOEs. So the employees, the workers, the people who are involved in those SOEs must have confidence in the party that is negotiating with them. Is that the stance of the government, the confidence in the government, the intentions of the government must be conveyed to the various parties which are involved in this uh, uh, change of management. No government has clearly spelt out the role of the private sector, has not given them the necessary incentives, and have not looked at them as a possible solution to some of the problems of the SOEs, overstaffing of the enterprises. That has become a political fact. Every single state organization is really a parking space for political refugees. In all these uh, commissions of inquiry, every type of uh, study is saying that all these institutions are heavily overstaffed. Every single government coming close to an election goes on a hiring spree. Once you're hired, you cannot be fired. So this just goes on and on, and uh, every single uh, report that is coming out about the SOEs shows that they are clearly overstaffed, and the way out is to expand the private sector so that these people also can be absorbed, and also to make a very attractive public sector. We believe in a very strong and dynamic private sector, but at the same time, we believe in a very strong state sector acting as an enabler and providing the direction. So you can't separate these two. It is like you need two hands to clap, you need both. Particularly given the current status of our economy, given the journey that we have to go, we believe we need to have a good balance between these two. Not all SOEs are making money, not all SOEs are losing money. 20% of the SOEs are making good profits, whilst 20% of the companies are making losses. So we normally see these things and try to make a general assumption about the SOEs. It is not a problem with the SOEs, but the political interference into these organizations. So going forward, what do we have to do? We believe that state sector and the private sector both must be managed. And in the SOEs, we must be very clear of the objectives of the SOE. It is making money as well as there are broad objectives. But no SOE is allowed or should be making losses. We need to put right people there. We need to separate the management from the government. Ownership is of the government. The management must be separate. If the, the SOEs are given clear objectives, given independent managements to manage, put the right people there, and put the right uh, KPIs and monitor that SOEs in this country can do well. Now, the Gazette notification on the holding of the presidential elections has been issued a short while ago. According to the notification, by virtue of the powers vested in the Election Commission by Section 2 of the Presidential Election Act No. 15 of 1981, read with Article 104B of the Constitution, October 7, 2019, has been declared as the date of nominations of candidates. Election Secretariat in Rajagiriya has been stated as the place of nomination of candidates for the presidential election. November 16, 2019, has been declared as the date on which the poll for such election to be taken. Now, measures have been taken to send a letter of demand against Kalum Palita Mahiratna for making insulting and false statements on the Sri Lanka Rupvahini Corporation and its chairperson. It has been pointed out that a statement made by Kalum Palita Mahiratna at a media briefing has caused damages to the SLRC and its chairperson. Accordingly, the letter of demand says that the accused should pay a sum of 500 million rupees for tarnishing the good name of the Sri Lanka Rupvahini Corporation. According to the letter of demand, a further 500 million rupees should also be provided over defamation personally inflicted upon chairperson Enoka Satyangani Kirtinanda. 
The Army headquarters says that reports pertaining to a group connected to the Army was preparing to launch an attack similar to the Easter Sunday attack using the Internet, electronic and print media are totally false. The Army headquarters issuing a communique points out that such propaganda damages the reputation of the Army and also creates an unnecessary fear among the general public. The Army further points out that such rumors would create a harmful impact on daily activities as well. The release also says that the Army and the Criminal Investigation Department are conducting investigations on the person who made statements in this connection. The Government Medical Officers Association has conducted a one-day token strike based on several demands including elimination of salary anomalies. Our correspondents say that as a result, patients who have arrived at government hospitals were subject to numerous difficulties. Due to work stoppage, clinical activities and functioning in the outpatients departments were not conducted appropriately. In many hospitals, only the essential services were carried out. Meanwhile, the Forum of Government Medical Officials say that the strike organized by the Government Medical Officers Association has been unsuccessful. The Government Medical Officers Forum says that it has not extended support to the strike. Minister Ranjit Madhum Bandara says that the strike has been conducted on political grounds. The Parliament has approved today to extend the period granted to present the final report of the Special Selecting Committee appointed to investigate and report to Parliament on the Easter Sunday attack till the 31st of October. The relevant proposal has been presented to Parliament by Minister Lakshman Kiriella. The Parliament has also passed today the amended draft bill on commercial shipping. The Parliamentary Select Committee has questioned a range of witnesses during its investigation, including the Prime Minister, Government Ministers and Senior Security Forces, Commanders, PSC members, are due to record a statement from President Maitripala Surisena on the 20th of this month. Chairman of the Corp Parliamentarian Sunil Handunetti says that if there was any discrepancy caused in the provision of an advance for the construction of the Lotus Tower, a comprehensive investigation will be conducted in this connection. The parliamentarian made these remarks delivering a statement to the media in the parliament complex today. Chairman of the Corp Parliamentarian Sunil Handunetti said that he would summon all institutions involved in the Lotus Tower project to give evidence before the Commission on issues related to various allegations on the project. The Corp's decision to conduct a probe comes after President Maitri Palasirisena's comments at the opening ceremony of the Lotus Tower regarding the government's loss of 2 billion rupees from the project. Japan provides 2 million US dollars grant aid for implementation of women, peace and security agenda in Sri Lanka. The exchange of notes for the project was signed today at the residence of the Japanese ambassador. Signatories to the agreement were Ambassador of Japan in Sri Lanka, Akira Sugiyama, and the Regional Director of UN Women for Asia and the Pacific, Mohamed Nasiri. Secretary to the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs and Development of Dry Zones, Darshini Senanaika, the has WPS also attended women, the peace ceremony. And security agenda stems from the international community's recognition that gender equality, empowerment of women and girls, and respect for their human rights vital to achieving and sustaining peace. In 2018, the G7 foreign ministers renewed their commitment to increasing women's active participation in political governance and security structures in order to achieve sustainable peace and security. The G7 members proceeded to establish a G7 WPS Partnership Initiative to provide targeted support to conflict-affected partner countries. It is in this context that the government of Japan, as a lead G7 country for Sri Lanka, is extending its support to the government of Sri Lanka in its implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and subsequent resolutions in cooperation with UN Women. In March this year, under the G7 WPS Partnership Initiative, the government of Japan provided a grant aid worth 500,000 US dollars through UN Women for the project of Empowered Women, Peaceful Communities, promoting peace and preventing intolerance in Sri Lanka to support the government of Sri Lanka's development of a national action plan in the field of women, peace and security.
Sri Lanka is now in a post-conflict era, negotiating a path towards reconciliation and justice. Critical to this journey is the political and economic empowerment of Sri Lanka's women. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda, with its focus on women's participation and empowerment in efforts to prevent and resolve conflicts, remains a vital tool to build a more peaceful and inclusive society. The National Action Plan, developed with the support of this project, promises a framework to address the needs and priorities of women and communities impacted by conflict, creating spaces for them to engage in discussions and actions for sustainable peace. The overall goal of this project is to empower women, including those in vulnerable situations. It will also strengthen the peace building process in Sri Lanka through the implementation of the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, which is currently being drafted under phase one of the project. Under phase two of the project, the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs and also the second initiative is support up to 600 women with economic empowerment activities. This is for entire Sri Lanka. And the other one is build the capacity of up to 100 young women with skills to engage in peace building process and provide key stakeholders with opportunities for learning and knowledge transfer, including cross-regional learning on the implementation of the national action plan on women, peace and security. Welcome back to the news. President Maitripala Sirisena says that the present day teacher should be turned into a person with great personality with necessary innovating capabilities suitable for the teacher profession. The president was addressing a ceremony held in connection with the presentation of teaching appointments to 1,400 graduates in the northwestern province. The event was conducted at the Velagedara Stadium in Kurunagla this morning. A group including parliamentarian Dasiri Jayasekhar and governor of the northwestern province, Peshala Jayaratna, participated at the event. <laughs> President Maitripala Sirisena said that a survey of the Education Ministry says that there are 280,000 teachers in Sri Lankan teacher service. It also points out that 10% of the cadre are professionally unqualified. They lack the qualitative aspect of the teacher service despite having certificates. The President has also expressed hope that the new recruits would not fall into that lot and remain as qualified personnel in the service. He has also requested them to show respect to their education education, knowledge and intellect. He added that they are handing to the recruits not a student but a country and its future. The President also laid the foundation stone for an office for the Governor of the Northwestern Province. Now, meanwhile, a firearm and explosives buried in the vicinity of the entrance of the road of Oluville Harbour in Palamune in Akre Patu in Ampara have been detected. They have been found according to information received by the officials of the State Intelligence Service. The weapons were found buried in the home garden of a relative of an Ampara district activist, Shyam, of the National Tauhid Jamaat organization. The suspect is already in police custody. The raid has been conducted by a group of police officials based on the information received from the detained suspect. The police has recovered a stock of cash buried by Zaran in the area in May this year. Among the items found included a T-56 weapon, 30 live ammunition, one magazine, seven detonators and four sticks of gelignite. The police says that wires, ammonia, urea and several other items were also detected. And that's it for the news for today. We'll see you tomorrow at the very same time. Good night.